Welcome to Educator.com's Adobe Premiere Pro CS6 Fundamentals course. And this course we're going to talk about video editing. Now, a lot of people ask me what they can actually gain from this course. This course is specifically for Premiere Pro and is specifically geared toward people that want to do video editing. Now, one of the big things that people want to know about is certification. Um, I cannot tell you that this course will get you um, to where you can take the ACE test and pass it. That's not the purpose of this course. The purpose of this course is to get you um, knowledgeable in Premiere Pro and then to take the ACE exam, you want to be using the um, uh, the program at least for three years. However, I can tell you that if you go through the fundamentals part of this course, you should be able to take the ACA, which is the Adobe Certified Associate test, and pass it. Um, it's geared toward people that are first-time users or students in school. So you should be able to watch the fundamentals part of this and pass the ACA. Uh, however, I would recommend watching the entire thing before going to take the ACA, and then there will be no doubt if you learn what I have in these videos, you will be able to take the ACA and pass it um, probably pretty easily. The ACE, um, it's not only what you learn in this course and any other courses that you take with Premiere, but it's also actually using it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I was using Premiere for about eight years before I even took my first ACE exam. And just because I had that experience, I was able to pass that test uh, pretty pretty easily. So th those are two things that you can gain from taking this course. Another one is just being confident in your editing abilities. Um, I know a lot of people post to YouTube and uh, a few other websites. Um, if you are bad at editing, uh, you're not going to get any views on YouTube. People don't want to watch stuff that's really badly edited. Um, that's just something that um, I know of a lot of people will take this just to learn it, and other people will take it because they're going for a job. So... Um, if you're taking it just to learn it as part of your school, it's one of the classes, one of your elective classes, then uh, you can take the ACA and, and eventually the ACE exam and um, become a, an expert in this program. And it will help your job prospects later on if uh, they're looking for an ACE. That kind of sets you apart from somebody that hasn't taken and passed the ACE exam. Uh, they know that you know a minimum amount um, as a professional using the program. And don't think that knowing the minimum amount as a professional is easy. Um, there's a lot of things in that exam that you will have to know very specific parts of the interface or you will fail the test. So that's, that's just two of the things as um, that you can gain from this course. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the structure of the course. There are, um, there's a fundamentals part which will prepare you for um, the in-depth part and also prepare you for the ACA test. And you can watch through the fundamentals part of it and uh, decide whether you want to continue on with the in-depth part. If you get through the fundamentals and you realize that you're just n not going to have what it takes to be a video editor, then you can skip the in-depth part and you don't, that would be it. There's only a few videos at the beginning that's part of the fundamentals uh, part of this course. But if you watch those and you realize that, yes, I want to be an editor, I want to do video editing, then you can watch the rest of the course. And that's the in-depth part of the course. The second uh, three quarters of this course is in-depth um, videos about things that we touched on in the fundamentals part. But there's also um, 
a video on Prelude, which is the ingesting program. There's, um, I believe, four videos for Encore, which is um, creating Blu-ray and DVD discs. And then uh, the very last video I talk about the um, uh, the files that I've made available to you so you can go in and practice using the uh, Adobe Premiere Pro. And then I also give you a way that you can contact me and I can ask, answer questions. I can answer it if you go down below. Um, there's a, a uh, discussion board below these sets of videos that you can go and ask me a question there. You can send it to the email I give you at the end. Um, I will, I can look at your video and give you suggestions. Um, you'll just have to upload it to like YouTube or something and then send me the link and I can give you suggestions about it. Um, and that's not just, uh, using Premiere Pro suggestion. That's also general, uh, video questions like, Maybe, do you think it, it's okay to use this shot here and this shot there? And I can give you some suggestions of standard practices that, that, um, videographers use to put together their videos. And I can give you feedback on all that. And I will go in at least twice a week and go through and answer as many of the questions as I have time for. So just know that if you ask a question and it's been a day or two, I will get in there and answer them. It just depends on how much time I have free um, that week. So I will spend a lot of my free time going and answering your questions. So if you have questions, please ask them either on the discussion or straight through the email I give you. And uh, please do not send the email out to other people. It's just for people on educator.com for them to ask me questions. So, um, that's the structure of the course that we have here. The next thing I want to talk about is what is Premiere Pro and why use it? Um, Premiere Pro is um, quickly becoming the number one video editing software. Um, more and more TV stations, more and more uh, movie companies are adopting it just because it is part of an entire suite. And they have an entire suite that they can do all of the things that they need to do to, to deal with a film or a DVD or a Blu-ray and uh, online and everything. Um, the entire suite you can have, um, you can build websites in Muse or Dreamweaver. You can um, create your DVD and your Blu-rays inside of Encore. You can InDesign and Illustrator and Photoshop, you can create your DVD cases and your Blu-ray cases. Um, in Premiere, obviously, you can uh, do your editing. In Audition, you can fix your sound. You can sweeten your sound, make it sound better. In Speed Grade, you can fix your color. You can um, make it so your video looks the way that you want it to look. Um, Prelude, you can bring in all of this video and you can bring it in as a rough cut already set, ready to go in Premiere before you even sit down to start editing it. Um, and all of these can be spread out over an entire department. So more and more companies are realizing that they have an entire suite that they can use to uh, work on their movies, their TV shows, uh, their their DVDs, their Blu-rays, all of this. And uh, more and more of them are adapting it. And that's one of the main reasons why a lot of them are changing to Premiere Pro. And it's also just because of the entire breadth of video that it can, it can handle natively inside of the program. Um, if you're using Final Cut Pro or using Avid Media Composer, um, you have to use other programs that aren't directly integrated through, like Dynamic Link is what Adobe uses to you bring a file over to Photoshop. You edit it like a menu from Encore. You edit it in Photoshop. As soon as you go back into Encore, all of the changes you've made are automatically um, changed inside of Encore. 
That's the dynamic link. It links the two files that you're editing together. And you can go back into Photoshop, change it, come back to Encore. Your changes are there. You can change them in Encore. You go back to Photoshop and the changes you made here are there and vice versa. It's um, a very uh, standard way of, of working to where um, you can have all these different things going and you change it here, it changes there, it changes here. And the other two, the the two main ones, the Final Cut Pro and the Avid Media Composer, do not have that type of integration with other programs. So a lot of people are switching to Premiere, and I'm glad you're watching this, and maybe um, if you have Final Cut Pro or Avid, wherever you work or wherever you um, do editing, maybe you can tell them why they would want to switch to Premiere. And it's with the Creative Cloud now, you you pay a fixed monthly fee and you have access to all of these all of these uh programs in the entire suite and it's always the very latest version. So every time they add some new feature, it's automatically added to what you're able to do inside of Premiere and Photoshop and all the other programs as part of the Creative Suite. So that's just a few of the reasons why people are using Premiere Pro and why they're switching to it. Well, the next thing I want to go over is some common filming techniques. Um, these are some things that um, I might not get to in the regular videos, but I need you to know uh, some of these, if you are the person that's going out to film um, your whatever project you're working on, if you are the person that's doing that, there's some common filming techniques that I want to go over really quick so you know, uh, in case I don't get to them in the other videos, I will get that information to you. And one of the ones is catching ambient sound. Um, getting, when you go to a location, you want to do an interview and you know that there's birds chirping way over in the tree over there and you know that you hear rustling over and the wind is blowing through the weeds over there or any sound that's just an ambient sound let your camera run for a few minutes before you start doing anything else and capture all of that onto a tape onto either a dedicated sound recorder or onto your camera or whatever you're you're recording so when you get back into your editing bay you have that as a backup that you can put as a um, as a layer on your as one of your tracks in your timeline to where if you have holes in your regular audio it will fill them in and another thing i want to talk about are handles if you're filming somebody um there's a reason why uh if you go if you're if you're watching them film say uh Pirates of the Caribbean number 27 and you're on set and you see the guy come in with the clapper board which is the board that makes the snapping sound and that's used for a sync sound which I'll get to in just a moment but after they do that there's a few seconds where uh, nothing happens and then you'll hear the director say and action and what that is that that let that gives that um piece of video what are called handles and what that does is it lets um that lets you have a little bit more freedom when you're editing so if you have transitions or other things that you need to apply to that video there's there's pieces on the beginning and the end that um aren't part of the actual video but there's nothing that um uh actually happens in it but it will let you combine videos to where you have an overlap of your video so if you need to put a transition of one second in there you have 15 frames on this side and 15 frames on this side of the extra that will let you add that transition without cutting into the actual action that you want to show in your video if you don't have those it's going to make adding transitions much more difficult because there's nothing for premiere to to use at the beginning or the end if you need to put a transition in so those are what are what are called handles and they let you make it'll make your job a lot easier in your editing now the 
The third thing I want to make sure I go over is what sync sound is. Sync sound is when you're using the clapperboard and you want to make sure that all of the cameras that you're using can see the clapperboard when you, uh, when you are filming. If you have five cameras and you have a clapperboard, you're using sync sound and you have one guy that's doing recording the audio, um, the clapperboard will let you sync that up. So you don't have the voice, the voice coming out and then the, the, um, the, uh, the mouth moving. It's very disconcerting for somebody to watch a video where the sound isn't synced with the action that's on, on screen. And a lot of times they will just completely dismiss the movie just because of something, even a half of a second off, uh, our minds can see that it's, it's messed up and and we don't want to watch a, an entire movie where the sound is out out of sync like that so the sync sound is another thing that is really important to do and make sure that all of the cameras can see that snap because you're going to match the snap when you see the two pieces come together with the sound that the guy that recording this uh recording the sound you want to match that snap on the audio recording with the snap on the video. So those are some common filming techniques. I want to make sure I get through at the beginning so you know uh, if I don't get to them later, which I might or I might not, I want to make sure that you know uh, about those because all three of them will make your job of editing much, much easier. Next, I want to talk about copyright issues. And this is something that um, a lot of new editors, um, if they they don't know about copyright issues, they can get in a lot of trouble. If you're if someone pays you to make a commercial, and you decide that um, uh, Justin Bieber's new song is going to work perfect in your commercial, and you create your commercial with his music, and then you broadcast it. Um, you're going to be paying a licensing fee that's a fixed licensing fee that, um, and they can also have you pull the commercial if they want because you're using something that's copyrighted without, uh, express written permission. If you are going to use a piece of music or a piece of video that somebody else has copyrighted, you want to make sure you get a specific written release to use that video or that audio otherwise you can be in a lot of trouble just having some oh yeah go ahead use it that's not that's not something that is um going to help you in a court case yeah oh yeah he told me i could use it uh-huh yeah sure um if you have it written down you can say look I have it here. He said I could use this video for this many showings on television between this date and this date. And I pay him X amount to do that. And he takes you to court. You show that to the judge and, and you don't have to worry about it. If you don't have that paper, you don't have that express written permission to do it, you can get in a lot of trouble. That's why I recommend students start getting some royalty free music this is music and royalty free graphics from a like this one just happens to be from digital juice um i've purchased a lot of their stuff all of their stuff is royalty free i can use this now i can use this 10 years from now i can use this 50 years from now without having to pay any more to use the audio that's on these dvds i can um use it for any project I just can't take the original files and sell them. Um, that is not part of the licensing agreement. But I, if I want to make a commercial with one of these, um, if I want to use that for a movie, I have no problem uh, doing any of that stuff with the royalty-free uh, music or graphics. Um, it's just something to think about. And I'm going to show you this thing of some of the penalties that you can get if they find that you are guilty of copyright infringement. And you might think, well, nobody ever actually uh, gets sued for any of this stuff. But 
right now there is a woman that uh, I think she shared 20 songs on some uh, file sharing system and she owes $222,000 just because she had these songs on her computer and they were being sent out to other people. So it's the same type of thing. You're distributing it out to other people. If you put it on a commercial and you have it on a broadcast network, you are sending it out to other people. And all of these things can apply to you if they decide to sue you for it. And that's the actual dollar amount of damages and profits. Plus a range from 200 to 150,000 for each work infringed. So if you have, like she had, uh, 20 songs and it came out to $222,000. So somewhere in this range, they figured out each song is worth X amount. They multiplied it by 20 and you have $222,000, which is quite a bit of money. And then you will also pay the attorney's fees for not only you, but also the person that's suing you and court costs for uh, the judge and any arbitration or anything else that comes up as a result of this. Then they can also issue an injunction to stop whatever you're doing to distribute. They can impound the illegal works, which if they're on your computer means they take your computer and you never see it again. And you can go to jail. If it's really egregious, they can send you to jail for it. Now, the flip side of this that I tell people is whenever you create a video, the first thing you should be doing is sending a copy along with the registration to the copyright office. Because if somebody then uses your video for something else or your audio for something else, all of these things will be in favor of you instead of against you. Having that piece of paper, even though you have the copyright um, to whatever you create immediately, having that piece of paper gives you not just the first one here, which is the actual dollar amount of damages and profits, but also all of these other two through six are also available to you because you have a written statement from the copyright office that you sent them your material and had it copyrighted and trust me anytime any major media company does anything online uh, not not just on but on broadcast or in movies or music or anything that they create the first thing they do is they're sending off to the copyright office a registration so then they can do all of this if you use it in one of your projects without express written permission. And that's very important. Written permission. Don't just take somebody's word that you can use something. So the next thing you want to go over is contacting Adobe. Now you might need, you might be using Premiere for a while and you realize, hey, I wish it could do this. Or I wish it, it would, if I did this, it would show this. If it did this, I would, and you might want to be able to contact them and say, Hey, can you, can you add this feature? Or I went to do this and it wouldn't do it. Uh, I'm going to report that there is a problem with this program. Um, you can contact them. There is a, a, uh, uh, website, a link that you can put into your browser, bit.ly bit.ly slash video wishlist. And it's not only just reporting bugs and feature requests for Premiere, but it's for any of the Adobe products. If you're in Photoshop and you say, hey, can you, uh, it'd be a good idea to put a button that uh, you just click it and it turns your picture into grayscale. You can go to the site, add in the information, and they might not respond to you. Um, if they If they have more than one person doing the same one, and uh, most likely they won't respond to you. Um, they'll only respond if they have specific questions for you. But do know that um, there is somebody in each division for Premiere, for Photoshop, for Illustrator, for every single one of these programs, there is somebody um, 
I know from personal knowledge that somebody reads each and every single one of these bug reports and feature requests. They, they don't just gloss over them. They read every single one. So if you're making a feature request, be very specific. If it does this, you want to do this and this, and there's a button to do this and this and this and, and make it so, um, they don't have to email you back and say, Hey, what did you mean by this? Just be very specific. And if you're doing a bug report, um, uh, Upload your project file somewhere or um, send them an email and attach it and say, here's my project file. When I tried to do this, I got this error. What is the problem with it? Um, that way they know exactly what they need to look at. And there is, um, I believe it's every three months, they have what they call a small item um, uh build where they go in and they spend two or three days where they'll they have a big long list of stuff that are little little changes to the program that people have requested and they will put them in the most down to the least requested and somebody will go in and say i'm going to spend the next day or two just doing this one item and they will go through and they get as many of those done as they can so your feature requests you might request something and then when they do an update to uh, Premiere and everybody downloads the update, your feature requests might have been incorporated in that update. So that's just something that if you want to um, go in and um, request something, here is where you're going to go. And I will include that link in the PDF files that you'll be able to download so you can um, send that to Adobe. Now, before we get to this last thing of finding lesson files, let me go over real quick the system requirements for the Mac and the OS, the Mac OS and the uh, Windows um, uh, operating systems. And there's three things in here that will make your video editing much faster. And the one is the first one here, the processor. If you have a multi-core processor, a very high speed multi core processor you you can edit video much faster and if you have the more ram you have the easier it will be to use your um uh premiere it'll make it much easier to use and the third thing is this open gl capable 2.0 capable system which is the adobe certified gpu and that's called a cuda card if you look on the box for a video card, and I believe there's only two um, ATI cards, but a lot of NVIDIA cards, it will say CUDA capable on it. And uh, I believe the ATI on, are the only ones that work with the Mac OS. Um, on the Windows, you'll have an NVIDIA, you'll have a big long list of NVIDIA cards that you can use that are CUDA capable. and Whatever the card is, that the best one that you can get uh, for how much, much money you have to put your system together, that's the one you want to get. Um, I never recommend buying parts for a computer that are um, underpowered. Uh, whatever you can afford to get, get it when you build the computer. Because nine times out of ten, you might only get four gigabytes of RAM for on your Mac OS and upgrading to eight just seems like such a hassle. You just never do it until you buy a new computer. Uh, if you get it when you get the computer, you don't have to worry about needing to upgrade later. And it's the same thing with the, the windows system. You want an in, Intel, uh, core two dual or AMD Phenom two processor minimum. Now, to run Premiere and Encore and all of the video software that comes for Adobe, um, you're going to need a 64-bit processor and a 64-bit operating system. Uh, you cannot run Premiere Pro CS6 in a 32-bit environment. All the Mac OS are 64-bit, but um, the Windows, uh, if you're buying a computer, make sure it's a 64-bit 
version of Windows, whether it's 7 or 8 or Vista. Um, I'm not sure if Vista is actually supported. It doesn't look like it's supported with CS6. Um, you might be using CS5 or 5.5, and those are also, you need a 64-bit uh, Windows. CS4, you can run it on 32-bit. Uh, if you have more than 4 gigabytes of RAM, to even use more than four, you're going to need a 64-bit operating system. So if you have eight gigs of RAM that come on your computer, uh, it's, auto, it's already a 64-bit operating system. Just so you know, if you're looking for a computer at the store. And again, RAM, you want to get as much as you can. If you can get 16 or 32 gigs in there, you want to get that much in there. It'll just make your editing go much faster. Um, the CUDA card for... Uh, either Mac or Windows, it'll also help your encode. So if you're sending it out to Adobe Media Encoder, it will make your encode much faster than if you don't have one of those cards. So these these are also on the Adobe website. If you just put uh, Premiere Pro uh, System Requirements, the first link or the second link will take you directly to the page that lists all the requirements. And if they if they update any of these, it will update on that website. So the final thing we want to talk about is finding the lesson files. All of the files that I use during this this um, course, uh, even these these title cards that I have here for each of the lessons, I'm going to have up on a website. And that is going to be at this link here. If you go to bit.ly slash Premier Files, and that is actually a uh, pseudonym that goes to uh, educatorfiles.com slash Premier. This links directly to this location online. So if this, for some reason, stops working, you can go to this um, location here and you can download the files um, off of the website and then practice with them. And I highly recommend you practice with them. But I will go over all of the files that are in the, um, in the upload up on the website at the end of it. And I will tell you what they're used for and how you can use them to practice with. So that was our um, our introduction to Premiere Pro CS6 here on Educator.com. Hopefully, you come back and watch the next set of videos, at least through the fundamentals, so you know whether you want to be an editor or not. And if you do, hopefully you complete the entire course and you go take your ACA and then work as an editor. So thank you very much for... Uh, watching and I hope to see you with your questions and uh, comments and requests pretty soon. Thank you.